When it comes to your retirement, do you want to have the same old plan everyone else has? Of course not. You're unique and have your own goals and dreams. Don't be treated just like a number. This is your retirement. So it's time to think differently. And you're in luck because you've found the Retire Your Way podcast with ILG Financial. At ILG Financial, you won't find generic run-of-the-mill plans containing the same old cookie cutter solutions. Dave Chase and the ILG Financial team focus on building one retirement at a time using their Think Differently philosophy. And that means your own comprehensive plan with customized solutions built to achieve just one goal, yours. So put on your Think Differently hats and get ready to take back control of your retirement today and for all the tomorrows to come. ILG Financial's Retire Your Way podcast was created just for you, and it's starting right now. When it comes to retirement, do you want to have the same old plan everybody else has? Of course you don't. You're unique. You have your own goals and hopes and dreams. Don't be treated just like a number. This is your retirement, so it's time to think differently. And you're in luck because you found the Retire Your Way podcast with ILG Financial. At ILG Financial, you won't find generic run-of-the-mill plans containing the same old cookie-cutter solutions. Dave Lopez, Chase Lopez, and the ILG Financial team focus on building one retirement at a time. And we'll start with yours. And today, we have a very interesting topic. I know you want to stick around for this. In 2024 alone, the baby boomer generation moved billions of dollars from retirement savings into tax-free accounts. The strategy that they use can make your nest egg last longer in retirement. Today, I'm joined by Dave Lopez to discuss what we have been seeing happening. The strategies that people, baby boomers in particular, have been increasingly using and what that can result in for your retirement and your nest egg. Well, Dave, how you doing? I am doing great. It's sure good to see you. Uh, I know folks listen to this podcast all throughout the year, but uh, we're right after the Thanksgiving as of the recording, and we were just enjoying sharing some sharing some conversations of how each of our families was doing. And I sure appreciate that, Ron, that we enjoy that. It sounds like you had a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about family and food and maybe a little football in there, too. And uh, it's uh, it's my favorite holiday. So Yeah, yeah, uh, ours, too. So it was good to do it and good to get back to work, right? Yeah. And uh, it'd be great to get back on this podcast today because this is a great topic to be going mm-hmm. over. Well, folks, this is the move that adds years to your retirement nest egg, and we're talking particularly today to baby boomers. So, Dave, tell everybody what we're going to talk about today. Sure. So the overarching strategy uh, that Ron was hinting at is called Roth conversion strategies. So we've talked about Roth conversions in detail in the past. For those of you who've been on the podcast, you've heard us mention it before. We've done YouTubes on it, and it's in our newsletters. Uh, But the reason it's so important for us to cover today is because President-elect Donald Trump has pledged to extend his 2017 tax cuts. Now, that is great news if you are in or near retirement. So let's jump right in, and we'll kind of do a little history about exactly what's going on, what Roth conversions are, and then we'll talk about opportunities for those listening. How does that sound, Ron? Yeah, Roth conversions, I mean, that's a topic that we talk about a lot on this show. And uh, why don't we just start with the basics. Uh, You explain what a Roth conversion is and how it affects folks. Sure. So imagine you've got a traditional 401k uh, or a traditional IRA. Those are called, in our industry, tax-deferred accounts. And just as a reminder for those of you who may have forgotten when you're contributing to those, when you put the money in, you get a tax deduction, which is very attractive, right? You're, you save a little money on your taxes in the year that you make that money. The trade-off to that, Ron, is that that money is growing tax-deferred, meaning if you make $5 in interest in that account this year, it doesn't show up on your taxes, and that means the whole $5 can be reinvested. So the account's growing and compounding tax-deferred, which is also very attractive. Mm-hmm. Now, nothing's free, right? And the payoff or the trade-off to that tax deduction and the compounding tax deferred is that when you withdraw the money from a traditional 401k or when you withdraw the money from a traditional IRA, you now owe taxes on the entire amount of the withdrawal. It doesn't matter. There's no distinction between what was put in and what was earned and, and what grew because you haven't paid taxes on any of it. Make sense? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense, and and I don't like the way this is going. (laughs) Well, there's a it's a little worse too. Uh, A lot of this is a nuance a lot of folks miss. When it comes out, it's taxed as ordinary income tax. So that might not mean a lot to a lot of people, but notice there's two different type of taxes you can pay based on how the money you is earned. Mm-hmm. So if you earn the money through uh, work, right, for a paycheck, it's taxed at what's called your ordinary income rates. And those can be as low as 10%. It's a progressive tax code in the U.S., Ron. So for lower income people, they might be paying zero or 10%. And then after you've made a little bit more, the next batch of earned co- income is taxed at 12. And then after you make a little more, the next batch of in- earned income is taxed at 22, then 24, then 32, and so on. The more you make, the more taxes you pay in ordinary income. That, to make, to make a long story short, is the most expensive tax on income you can have, your ordinary income tax rate. The mm-hmm. other tax rate you could pay is called capital gains tax. Now, that's not on earned income that you make from work. That would be from income you earn from your investment. So if you make $10 in interest at the bank, right, that's investment income. So you will pay capital gains tax on that, and that's split into two different types of capital gains. Uh, short-term capital gains, that's a gain that was made and you held it less than a year. So that's going to really take care of any interest that you earn, CD interest or bank interest. It would also take care of anything that you, if you bought a stock and sold it within a year or you bought real estate and sold it within a year short term, it's lumped into that ordinary income tax. Again, that higher tax rate is the same as the short-term capital gains rate. But the long-term capital gains rate is smaller. It can be anywhere from zero to right now currently 15% or 20%, which based on your income is less than your ordinary income tax. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, makes perfect sense. So that's a lot of data. So all that means, I I tell you that just to say this, the downside to being in a tax deferred account is that when their money comes out, you don't even get the chance to get the lower capital gains rate. Mm -hmm. When that money comes out, it's taxed at your ordinary income rate, which for an individual or a couple is the highest tax rate that is applied to you. So it's it's inefficient when it comes out. So it's one of those things that's very attractive going in, and then you look down the road and you're ready to retire, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, this isn't nearly as attractive. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's really you know how the tax-deferred accounts work, IRAs and 401Ks. Now here's the trick. When 401Ks and IRAs were instigated, and you have to go back to the early 80s for this, they were raved about as a great way to save for retirement. But here's the trick. It was all based on one mathematic assumption. And that assumption was that you would retire, Ron, in a lower tax rate than the tax rate you were paying when you contributed. Mm -hmm. Right? So imagine if you made $10,000 that you wanted to save for retirement this year, and you're in the 32% tax bracket. If you put that into your 401k, you save this year that's the key this year, you save 32% tax on that $10,000, or what would that be? $3,200, right? Mm-hmm. You save on your taxes this year. That's a good deal if you that money sits and grows, and over the next 20 years, that, that money, that $10,000 grows to $100,000, and then you start to take it out in increments in retirement. But in retirement, in theory, you maybe retire in the 12% bracket. So you saved 3200 and when it, the money comes out, you're only paying 1200 Make sense? Okay, yeah. That's the theory. That's what makes 401ks a good deal and IRAs a good deal. The problem with that is that's for many people, and depending on who you talk about, most people, is not how it's working in the real world. In the real world, they're retiring often in the same tax bracket, or sometimes in a higher tax bracket than when they were working. And if you do the math, if you're retiring in a higher tax bracket, you're better off not doing a traditional 401k. You actually pay more taxes. Imagine mm-hmm. that same example, right? You, you're in the 32% tax bracket when you save the money. So you save $3,200 in taxes by putting your money in a 401k, right? Mm-hmm. You retire, but when you retire, let's say you're in a 40% tax bracket. So now, not only are you paying $4,000 on the $10,000 you put in, but you're paying 40% on all the gains as well. So that's what has all of a sudden, the light has come on for the financial community and the, 
accounting community to say, hey, listen, more and more people are saying, I'm not retiring in a lower tax bracket. Is a 401k still the best way to go? And the short answer is, you've got to make a bet. And the bet's going to be based on the data you and your financial professionals have and look at and a bet on what you think's happening in this country and where taxes are going. If you retire in the same tax bracket that you were in when you put save the money, it would, really doesn't matter if you used a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA, a Roth 401k or a traditional 401k. The math would end up the same if it's the same bracket. If, on the other hand, when you're in retirement, you're in a higher tax bracket than when you save the money, then you would have better off not being using a 401k or an IRA, but instead using a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA. Mm-hmm. Now, how do they differ? A Roth 401k and a Roth IRA, when you put that money in, Ron, you are not getting a deduction when they put the money in. So if you put $10,000 in, you can put the $10,000 in the Roth 401k, but your paycheck is lowered by that, let's say you're in the 32% tax bracket, it's lowered by that 3200 You've got to pay tax on that money. Mm-hmm. But the trade-off is that $10,000 now grows compounding, compounding, no taxes, no taxes. And get this, when it comes out down the road 10, 20 years later, no taxes on any of it. Oh, man, that is really attractive to think about that. Right. So, again, if you did the math, and it's hard to do on a podcast, right, but to show you this, but if you had two people, you and me were identical. We saved the exact same amount, right, Mm -hmm. and – Uh, We got the exact same rate of returns over 10 years. The only difference was you used a traditional 401k and I used a Roth 401k. But everything else was the same. The amount of the contributions, the only difference was, let's in this argument, I I contributed less because I paid the taxes. So where you may have contributed 10,000, I may have contributed 6,800 because I had to pay the $3,200 in taxes. Make sense? Got it. Yeah. If you grew those exactly the same over 10, 20 years, and then it was time to take it out, if we both retired in the same tax bracket, we'd end up after taxes with the exact same money. Exact same money. It wouldn't have mattered which way we did it. Mm-hmm. If we were, were 1% higher in taxes when we retired, I would have done better than you doing the Roth. Yeah. If, on the other hand, we were 1% less in taxes when we retired than when we put the money in, you would have been better with, than me in the traditional. Does that make sense? <laughs> yep. So that's the easiest way to decide, hey, should I be contributing to a Roth? And you've got to make some assumptions. The assumptions are, based on your income, are you going to be in the same tax bracket in retirement that you're in and work? And that's something your financial advisor should help you with. And your accountant should be able to help you make those estimates based on any pensions, any social security and things like that, what your income is going to be, right? Uh, But the other thing you have to try to factor in is, are there going to be tax increases or are there going to be tax decreases? Because Mm -hmm. that will affect things as well. The reason this is getting so much traction and the reason so many people, as you alluded to in the beginning of this call, are opening their eyes and saying, I'm going to, I've got to do these Roth conversions, which we'll talk about in just a minute, is that overwhelmingly people are coming to the realization that they don't know when, but sometime in the relatively immediate future, taxes must go up. And the argument is we are, if you look historically, we are at historically low tax rates. A lot of people don't know that because they haven't looked and nobody likes taxes. So I don't know that I've ever said, hey, you're in this tax bracket. Is that high or low? They'll probably say it's high, wouldn't they? Mm-hmm. Right? So. But if you look back at rates in the, the 70s and the 60s and uh, after World War II, right, the taxes were hot, much higher. So you're in a position here where we're at historically, historically low tax rates. But we are, as of the recording of this podcast, we're over $36 trillion in debt with the federal government. That's amazing. $36 trillion. And just to give you how big of a deal that is, the interest yearly on that debt right now is over $1 trillion. Mm-hmm. Now, that number for a lot of people runs meaningless because it's just too hard to fathom. Let me give you an idea. For the first time ever in the spring, the interest on the debt surpassed the total spending, get this, on the Department of Defense budget. Wow. So as of, again, as of today, when we're recording this, the interest on the debt is about a trillion dollars. 
the Department of Defense budget is about $950 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a good way to let it sink in. If you can just imagine everything that's spent on the Department of Defense, payroll, uh, logistics, ships, planes, everything, right? Yeah. We're spending more just on interest. Now, the saddest part of that, of course, is imagine if we somehow hadn't gotten into this debt mess and that $1 trillion wasn't needed for interest because we had no debt. Imagine what we could do. Pretty much anything any politicians ask for, we could probably go ahead and do with that extra trillion. That's the saddest part. It is right? totally out of control. That's for sure. And yeah. it can't sustain. It can't be that way forever. We've got to do you, something. Yeah. So you couldn't have put it better. More and more accountants and financial professionals are saying out loud for the first time, look, there is no end game here. Right. The end game is draconian cuts in, ta- in spending by the government, which neither party has ever showed any interest in doing. Correct. Mm-hmm. Or we got to raise the income base for the government, which is taxes. So something's got to give. Now, if taxes start going up and they go just go, you know, just go back to where they were in the 60s and 70s. Those rates are almost double what they are today. Double. Yeah. Right. So. What's happening is people are saying, goodness gracious, if taxes could go up that high in the future, but even if they don't, if they go up at all in the future, I'm better off paying the taxes now at historically low rates. Make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Right, so if if there's a takeaway from this, the folks that follow this, and I'm one of them that agree with this theory, you need to look at taxes right now as they're on sale. And you have a unique opportunity if you have a 401k or an IRA, you owe taxes on that money. The government's given you an opportunity to say, listen, if you would like to settle up with us now instead of wait till down the road in retirement when you're pulling the money out, you can actually move that money from a traditional 401k or a traditional IRA and just move it to a tax-free Roth account. Now, that's a good deal, isn't it? It really is, yeah. So what's the catch, right? The catch is the government says, if, by the way, if you do that, any money you move over, you've got to pay the tax on it today. Yeah. Right? So you pay the tax now or you pay the tax later. But more and more, the conversation is becoming clear that more people are coming to the conclusion that I'm better off biting the bullet, paying the taxes today at today's lower rates, and then getting it, that money now is in a, a settled up with the government that's now in a Roth IRA, and it's tax-free for the rest of my life. So in the future, if taxes go up, they won't affect the Roth account. Reminds me of that old uh, television commercial or radio commercial for some oil company. It's like, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's you know what? That's the, big, that's the big question is people think, well, why would the government do this for us? Well, they're not doing us necessarily in fa- any favors. They're doing what everybody does. If you have a friend or a family member or a neighbor who's just ridiculously in debt and there doesn't seem to be any solution, mm-hmm. then they have to start making some bad decisions just to stay afloat, right? Yep. If you ever knew anyone who went and got a payday loan and you're like, that's horrible, or threw something on their credit card at 15% interest, and you're like, that's a horrible decision. And their position is, it, it is, I know, I don't have any other choice, right? I'm just trying to... We'll have to deal with tomorrow, tomorrow. I'm just trying to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. Well, that's arguably where our federal government is. The reason they're doing the Roth, allowing these Roth conversions is they need the tax dollars today. And they're willing to give up the fact that they might in in total over your lifetime collect more later by, you know, deferring it. They can't afford to defer it because they need the tax dollars. We're Mm -hmm. adding, you know, we're adding close to $2 trillion a year to that $36 trillion. You know, so Dave, they're having I, to. I've heard anybody else explain it this way. Um, nobody else has said it in such a way that it becomes crystal clear why the government is doing it this way. I mean, yeah, they, you they got no the choice. Money. So a lot of folks ask me, it ha- comes up all the time, Ron, is, do you think they're going to get rid of Roth conversions? I go, no. In fact, if you look late, they've actually made it easier to do Roth conversions. Mm hmm. Uh, because they actually ca- you know, they count that as extra income. And then this year they can brag that they got extra income, well, higher revenues, but at the cost of bigger revenues later. So you can use the government's short-sightedness to your advantage. But there's some pain. Why do I, I can't tell you how many times I've walked a client through this. And they, in theory, completely get it, understand they do a not Roth conversion, at the end of the day decide not to. And you know why? 
Why? Because they've got a million dollars in their IRA, and they say, Dave, over the next three or four years, if I convert this, my million dollars turns into seven hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So what I tell them all the time, and for any of you listening, if there's a takeaway to this podcast, this is it. If you have a million dollar IRA, as an example, it's true no matter how big your IRA is or your four hundred one k. But in this example, if you have a million dollar IRA, understand you don't. Under current tax code, you probably have a seven hundred thousand dollar IRA because you owe the government taxes on it, federal mm-hmm. and state taxes. And, and I would suggest this. Think about this. If it was anyone other than the government, if it was a investment firm or a bank, and you got a statement every month, the government would demand that they put a disclaimer on the statement that said, million-dollar account balance. And then in big letters, in big, bold print, note, uh, this bank has a fee charge currently of 30% on this account. Wow. Right, your true balance is seven hundred thousand, and then another a disclaimer that says this bank has the ability and the authority to change the amount of their fee at any time for any reason. <laughs> I don't and, think anybody would like that. <laughs> that's right, but that's the deal we made on the Roth four hundred one ks and uh, I mean, so on the traditional four hundred one ks and the IRAs, and it would have all worked if taxes stayed low and if you retired in a lower bracket. But most folks don't retire in a low bracket that I deal with. And the reason is, is you've got a, a, a lifestyle that you and your wife are used to living, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Right? So what happens is, one thing happens is when you retire, you lose a lot of your deductions. Often your house is now paid off or close to paid off, so your mortgage deduction is gone or much lower, right? And then you, most folks lose their biggest deduction. You want to guess what that is? What? It's a contribution to your Roth 401k. <laughs> Right. So and people don't even think about it. But if you're both working and maxing out your Roth 401k, you can each put in about thirty thousand five hundred dollars as of twenty twenty four. So a married couple could contribute almost sixty one thousand dollars of their income if they could were saving is taken off their taxes while they're working. When they retire, that goes away. So when you retire, not only you think, well, I'm making less, so I'll be paying less taxes. Well, you're losing a lot of the deductions. So even though you're making less, your taxable income might be the same. Make sense? It makes perfect sense. Now, add that. you have your Many have a pension and Social Security checks, but even if people just have Social Security checks, but then they've got big 401ks or IRAs, well, that money's never been taxed. So if you want to live the same lifestyle you're living, you've got to make up the difference that you're not getting from your Social Security from these taxable accounts. So that's why when we do these income plans for our clients, many of them are surprised that they're in the same tax bracket in retirement that they were when they were working. It's a combination of loss deductions and the fact that they still need the same, you know, they're not taking a dramatically lower lifestyle or budget. So that's the problem, right? What's the solution? The solution is We can take advantage of this opportunity because, and the reason we wanted to do this podcast now is, I I mentioned, because of the election, Mm -hmm. the current tax code, these taxes on sale that I've been talking about, they were set to go away at the end of 2025 when they they were put in place by President-elect Trump back in 2017 when he took office. The only way he could get this, his tax code approved was that he had to include what's called a sunset clause, which basically meant the taxes dropped in 2017 when he took office, but in 2000, on January 1st of 2026, unless the government passes a law to extend the tax codes, if they do nothing, the tax codes automatically revert back to the 2017 rates. Make mm-hmm. sense? And we know what those are, and they were higher. The 22% bracket will go up to 25%. The 24% bracket goes up to 28. The standard deduction gets lowered. It's just higher taxes. Okay, so that has been a big deal, which is why people have been talking about this because they said, "Hey, we've got a few years to do this before the taxes revert." We've got, in effect, you know, people could try to squeeze a conversion in this year in 2024, and they would have had next year, 2025, and then before the taxes go up. Well, when the election ended and it looked like that the Republican Party got the House, the Senate, and the presidency, the, one of the promises President Trump made was, I'm going to extend the tax cuts. And if he has the House and the Senate and the presidency, he'll probably be able to do that. 
So it's great news if you're a retiree. What it means is we very likely may have several more years beyond 2025, maybe three or four if we're lucky, have these historically low tax rates. So what that means for you, Ron, and the folks listening is now we're not like stuck at just two years with this opportunity to take advantage of these low rates. We might have an extra two or three more years to take advantage of it, but you don't want to waste this time because many believe, and I'm one of them, that this party of low taxes cannot last forever. Yeah. Sooner or later, we can kick the can down the road because it makes politicians look good and no one wants to give bad news. But there will be a point, and no one knows what it is for sure, uh, but there's a point where they can't kick the can down the road, right? And at that point, taxes will have to start going up. And I, 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 we believe they'll go up more than just reverting back to the 2017 rates because someone's got to get a hold of this trillion-dollar interest bill. As you explained, um, that thing is so astronomically big that it can't continue that way. At some point, we're going to have to do something to to attack it. Yeah, and many people think that that deadline is probably going to be around 2030 to 2032. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, and again, it's different between who does the math, but, you know, if you're just adding, you know, two trillion a year, forget adding extra. We can probably, if you do the math in 10 years, right, we're at 56 trillion, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're adding, we're not being able to cover all the interest. So there's a theory that we're actually going to be adding more than $2 trillion because it's a compounding thing, like your credit card compounds. So most folks think maybe about eight years before we hit around $56 trillion. Now, at $56 trillion, based on current interest rates, it's a good guess that every penny of tax dollars would just go to interest. Now, isn't that frightening? I'm having trouble wrapping my head around all that. So the point would be at that point, if we let it go that far, then at that point, you'd, I don't know that you could kick the can down the road anymore. You'd have to do something. Uh, and even whatever you did may not be enough at that point, right? But mm-hmm. we can only kick it down the road so far. So we, the way we see it, we have a limited window here for those. I, we can't, I can't fix the debt problem, but what I can do is position my clients and the folks listening on this podcast so that at, if taxes go up an extraordinary amount in the future and you've done your Roth conversions and you've moved to tax-free accounts, it won't affect those accounts. Make sense? It makes really good sense, Dave, and you do a good job explaining it all. That's for sure. So just to give you some of the numbers, to give you an idea, f- folks in their 60s, mm-hmm. Roth conversions have risen sharply since 2017. What does that tell you? It tells you more and more people started talking about the fact that they recognize we're in historically low tax rates, right? About 300,000 people uh, in this 60s age range converted about $14 billion, Ron, to Roths in 2020. Wow. Okay, that's up, just to give you some perspective, that's up from about 137. So we went from 137,000 people in 2017 to 300,000, over double the people in 2020 were converting than those converting in 2017. In 2017, this group converted about 4.4 billion. In 2020, the group converted about 14 billion. So this is a movement of a, an awakening of people realizing, hey, I've got an opportunity here that's to position myself for me and ideally for my family, if they're going to inherit this money, to settle up with the government at you know historically low tax rates. About three times as much, actually. Yeah, in, in we, pro- we, we had about a year and a, a month left before mm-hmm. the election because they were slated to end on December 31st of 2025. But President Trump said he's going to extend them, and he's got the clout to do it, right, uh, with the House and the, and the Senate. It's probably likely he'll do it. We don't, don't know how many years he'll be able to extend it, but that's why we're having the call today. It, it, we've got like a renewed opportunity that we're not just having a couple years, and then we're going to have to bite the bullet and pay a little bit more. And we want people to hear it and take advantage of it. Dave, I appreciate you bringing us all up to date on Roth conversions, what they are, what they mean for us and what they can mean for you in the future in your retirement years. And gosh, I'm so glad you relayed these important messages today because there are so many people who need to hear them. Yeah, yeah. So I I will tell you, when we talk about this one comes up too, is, well, who should be thinking about Roth conversions? Mm -hmm. And the takeaway is it really is different for everybody. There are some situations when maybe younger people might take advantage of it. One of those might be, imagine if you're 40, 
and you've lost your job and you're like, oh, this is the worst. My income's gone off the cliff. Right. If there is any silver lining to that, that might be a year to do a Roth conversion at low rates, some of the money. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's somebody. But really, it's for folks right as they retire and they stop working. And this ideally in their early 60s, before Medicare has been turned on, there's opportunities to do this, certainly before required minimum distributions start. Right. It's a good time to do it. Required minimum distributions, just as a reminder to those listening, for your 401ks, traditional 401ks and your traditional Roths, if you don't need the money, you say, well, I'll just leave the money in there, right, and never pay taxes. And then the kids will just pay taxes when they inherit it. Mm-hmm. The government says, not so fast. We want our taxes. So even if you don't need the money in your 401k or your IRA, when you hit a certain age, and for those uh, born before 1960, so think 1951 to 1959, you're at age 73 – you have to start taking money out of your IRA and 401k, even if you don't need it. And the reason you have to take it out is they want to tax you on it. Make sense? Yep. So you take $10,000 out. There's a percentage. It starts at about 3.77%. It goes up every year after that because they want their money. They pay the tax. And so let's say you take $10,000 out. You lose 30% to tax. And now you're at uh, $7,000. Now, the seven, if you don't need the money, you can invest it, but you can't put it back in an IRA and you can't put it in a Roth. Now you have to put it in a regular account that's really taxed as you go every year. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So very inefficient. If your birth date is 1960 or later, your RMDs don't start till 75. That gets you a little bit of a break before you have to take them. But here's the, the reason this has become such a big deal. For those of you who don't need the money and it's just growing, when... RMDs hit, now this extra money, not only are you going to be taxed at what may be higher tax rates on the withdrawals, I I think we did a good job talking about that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But also, it could trigger higher taxes on your Medicare premiums or higher taxes on your capital gains taxes for your other investments. Ah. And that is an eye-opener to people. So, for example, with Medicare, uh, there's a thing, and you can look it up. It's called IRMA. I-R-M-A. And basically, there's a set tax for your Medicare Part B and your Part D. And it's about $174 for Part B a month uh, as of the recording of this. And then Part D is depending on which Medicare plan you do. But it, let's say it's $20 or something like that. Well, that's if you make to record too much income and that too much number for a single person is over 200,000 for if joint filers it's over 250 in reported income you've got to pay a surcharge on your medicare how does that sound <laughs> does not sound good <laughs> right and here's the tune so somebody who trips that irma surcharge would add on the low side $998 a year in taxes or extra medicare charges on the high side, they could add up to $6,000 a year in Medicare charges because they make too much. Mm-hmm. That's in addition to all the other, you know, the income tax that you have. So if you're married, it's double that, right? A married couple could add up to just shy of $2,000 a year in extra taxes on their Medicare, up to as much as, get this, 12000 extra a year if you make too much money on your Medicare. So. Wow. The, here's the here's the trick on that. Imagine if you did nothing, 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 and now you hit 73 or 75, and your RMDs, because you did such a great job investing, your RMDs are huge because your account's huge, and that causes your income that year to be higher, which trips the Medicare. So not only are you paying higher income taxes on your required minimum distribution withdrawal, but now you're paying more on your, your Medicare. It's like a domino effect. But here's the worst part. Now you can count on it probably happening every year for the rest of your life, right? Because every year you have to continue taking required minimum distributions. Make sense? Mm-hmm. Yep. So imagine over 10 years, right, 73 to 83, someone could have paid, in addition to higher taxes on the withdrawals, an extra uh, a married couple could pay an extra 20000 over 10 years to an extra $122,000 in Medicare premiums Ouch. because their, their RMDs bumped them up maybe into higher tax brackets. Uh, the other one I said is another tax. is called uh, net investment income tax, 
and that was proposed back by President Obama to help cover Obamacare. And that's a tax on investment income. So think interest from the bank or interest from a CD or you sell a stock at a gain or you sell real estate at a gain. Make sense? Or dividends, interest, not earned income or Mm -hmm. pensions. Well, that if you wait over a year for that, remember I said you get the long-term capital gains tax? We talked about that earlier. Right. It's a lower tax. If you had it less than a year, you pay ordinary income tax. But whichever one you pay on this investment income, if you make too much money, and that too much money for the uh, net investment income tax is, uh, what did I say, 200000 for single and two fifty for a, uh, a joint filers. Mm-hmm. Then in addition to the, the capital gains tax, you pay an extra 3.8% tax on your investment returns. Wow. Right? So- I think I got those numbers right. Though. That's that's right for the that's right for the net in, income tax. The IRMA it kicks in. I think I said one hundred and three thousand for single, and it kicks in for people earning over a hundred two hundred six joint. Don't worry on the podcast about the numbers where you qualify. Just know there are numbers. But the scary part about both those taxes, those are what I like to call run trigger taxes, which mm-hmm. means if you're, let me take the modified adjusted gross income for the Medicare. The number for joint filers is two, as of 2024 is $206,000. If you're $1 over that, if you make $206,001, that triggers the surcharge, right? It's not like, oh, it's only 1% of your money surcharge. No, it's, it's a surcharge. It's on or off like, the, like a light switch. Same thing with the net investment income tax, right? If you have net investment income, and if you're a joint filer and you're over 250, if you earned reported on your tax return 250,000 and one dollar, right, then you trip that net investment income tax. So that's in addition to taxes going up. So it can you can really be hit two, three different ways from higher taxes down the road in retirement. Yeah. And once RMDs stop, start, you really don't have a lot of options at that point. All right. So conversions are not as, it's, it's a little more difficult once the RMD start because your income's already higher, right? You can still do it, but you have to do it after you take your RMD. You have to take your RMD. You cannot convert that to a Roth, but you could do additional conversion to a Roth after that. But it gets trickier. Well, you have done such a great job explaining all this about Roth conversions today. And why should people get in touch with you now, Dave, to talk about all this? Yeah, so this was the great takeaway from this is, and don't get caught up on the numbers today. And I know I apologize if it sounded like we were rambling a little bit, but it's just so much information. Here's the takeaway is the Roth conversions are not for everybody. These, it's very specific to your particular situation. You need to have your financial professional. We at ILG here are glad to do it. If you don't have an ILG, if you don't have a financial professional, or if you've got one and they don't really, this isn't their thing, we're glad to, to walk you through this. Uh, but it really depends on your income now, your income in retirement, uh, how big your retirement accounts are. It's different for everybody. Right. So, but we have to calculate all of these different moving parts, like the IRMA tax for Medicare, the net investment income tax for capital gains, your income tax bracket now and later. So, get with a financial professional or give us a call. Have someone take a look at your situation and do an analysis to see if you would benefit from taking advantage of a Roth conversion. So, for many of you, it might be a little late to do 2024 because we're almost halfway through December. Uh, but, you know, if you get with your financial professional in the next you know, f- uh, week, there's a chance you could probably get one in in 2024 if you needed to. But with luck, we probably have more than one more year, thanks to the, the way the election turned out for us as retirees. So get, have that conversation with your financial professionals or give us a call. Let's talk about it, see if it's right for you, and try to lock you in to historically low tax rates. After this extraordinary explanation today, you're now one step closer to learning what a customized retirement strategy can do for you. Uh, Income, legacy, growth, it's all right here at ILG Financial. And it's about helping you plan for retirement your way so you can achieve your financial goals. Call ILG Financial today at 540-720-5656 or go online to ILGfinancial.com to learn more. 
And you can talk with Dave Lopez, Chase Lopez, the folks at ILG Financial are ready, willing, and able to help you get to and through retirement in the most efficient way possible. And that includes being tax efficient as well. Dave, it's been uh, my pleasure uh, hanging out with you today. And we thank all of our listeners for being with us. We sure do. Thanks for running the show, Ron. The information provided is for educational purposes only and is not intended as investment advice for any individual or entity. All information contained herein is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy. The views presented today are those of Dave Lopez and do not necessarily represent the views of the Alpha Star Capital Management, LLC. The opinions expressed are subject to change without notice and do not constitute financial, legal, or tax advice. Please consult your financial professional before executing any financial strategy. Investment advisory services offered through Alpha Star Capital Management, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Alpha Star and ILG Financial, LLC are independent entities. SEC registration does not constitute an endorsement of the firm by the commission, nor does it indicate that the advisor has attained a particular level of skill or ability.